Plot Summary of Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by D. Brown D. Brown starts Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee with an overview of the major political forces in North America in the second half of the 19th century. During this time, the United States had just come out of the Civil War. On the one hand, it was broken, but on the other, its military and government were stronger than they had ever been. After winning the Mexican-American War in the 1840s, the government started to move into the western half of North America. The U.S. government sent a lot of settlers to the Midwest and California, but most of the land west of the Mississippi was already owned by Native American tribes because of treaties that the U.S. government had made and signed. When this problem came up, the U.S. government often broke its own treaties and forced Native American tribes to move to small, empty reservations in places where no white people wanted to live. There were, of course, many Native American tribes that fought against the military's plan to move them. In each chapter of the book, Brown talks about a different tribe and how it has fought against the U.S. military in the past. In many ways, the Navajo tribe of the Southwest did better in the 19th century than almost any other Native American tribe. For hundreds of years, the Navajos raided Mexican towns. When the U.S. bought a large piece of land in Mexico, it sent troops to protect its new citizens from the Navajos. Kit Carson, a military leader and explorer, was given the job of uprooting the tribe and moving them to the miserable reservation of Bosque Redondo. Around the middle of the 1860s, Manolito, a Navajo chief, began to fight Carson. Manolito led his people across the southwest. They only stopped when they ran out of food. His people went hungry in part because the U.S. military burned down all Navajo land and killed all Navajo animals. In the 1860s, Little Crow was the leader of the Santee Sioux in the north. Little Crow started to lead his people against the U.S. when he found out that his ancestors had been forced to sign fake land deals that put the Santee on small reservations. He led raids on white settlements, but he eventually had to lead his followers north into Minnesota to avoid punishment. Little Crow gave up to the military in the end, and he and his men were all sentenced to death. In the 1860s, the Cheyenne tribe and the U.S. military got into fights. After a Cheyenne warrior who had done nothing wrong was killed, the Cheyennes attacked U.S. troops. At the end of the war, the U.S. Army killed hundreds of women and children in the Sand Creek Massacre. The Cheyenne chief, Black Kettle, agreed to give up his land and move to a reservation. A hunk papa leader named Sitting Bull hurt about the massacre around the same time. He and a lot of other important chiefs saw that the U.S. government was trying to kill off all Native Americans and that their only choice was to fight back. After the Civil War ended, the government sent negotiators to Native American tribes to try to get the chiefs to give up the land rights of their people. Red Cloud, who led the Sioux, was one of these chiefs. Red Cloud didn't want to talk to government officials, but he had to. But when he saw that white settlers were already breaking the peace treaty, he started fighting the American army in a secret war. Cheyenne warriors went to war with the U.S. because of what Red Cloud did. Red Cloud finally gave up and signed a peace treaty with the military. He also gave up Sioux land. At the same time, the Cheyennes, led by Roman Nose, kept fighting. But even Roman Nose had no choice but to give up. The most important Cheyenne leaders were either dead or in jail. In the 1870s, the Apache tribe in the Southwest fought back against the United States. At first, the Apaches wanted to keep the peace. However, when Apache Chief Cochise found out that his people were going to be kicked off their land, he became very angry. Cochise was in charge of attacks on white settlements, but when he died in 1874, the Apaches were temporarily less strong. Even after they were moved to California and lived there for a long time, the Modocs of Oregon were a peaceful people. But by the 1870s, white settlers had taken so much of their land and food that they were starving. The Modoc leader, Kintposh, took his people to the California lava beds. He begged the U.S. government to let him and his people go back to Oregon. The government didn't let them in because some young Modocs had attacked American soldiers. During a negotiation, Kintposh killed Colonel Edward R. 
s can be because he was so angry he was caught and put to death for the crime but after that the modocs were able to go back to oregon two powerful chiefs satanta and lone wolf led the kiowa tribe but the kiowa way of life was being threatened by white settlers who were killing millions of buffalo as a result Lone Wolf led an army against the white settlers who were moving into Kiowa territory. He fought for many years, but in the end he had to give up. After that, the Kiowas were called a broken people. The same thing happened to the Sioux tribe in Nebraska. White settlers found gold mines that were worth a lot of money, and the government tried to get Sioux chiefs to give up the mineral rights to their land. But Crazy Horse, a Sioux leader, led a group of Sioux who fought against the U.S. military in the area. At the end of his fight, Crazy Horse beat the army led by General George Armstrong Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn. But Crazy Horse was caught just a year later and stabbed to death. For many years, the Ute tribe lived in peace, but in the 1870s, after a series of misleading treaties, the U.S. military started forcing the Utes off of their land. Infuriated, a group of Utes killed Nathan C. Meeker, who was in charge of the Utes for the government. After that, some Utes were found guilty of murder and sent to prison. The rest of the tribe moved to Utah. During the same ten years, Geronimo, the last of the great Apache chiefs, gave up and gave himself up to the U.S. He died not long after. Sitting Bull had led a group of Sioux warriors in a fight against the government for many years. But at the end of the 1870s, he led his people to Canada. When his men started to die of hunger, he had to go back to the U.S. there, he became part of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, which was a strange way to start a career. But he stayed a symbol of Native American resistance as long as he was alive. Near the end of his life, Sitting Bull became a big supporter of the ghost dance movement, which was a kind of Christian sect that used Native American rituals. Sitting Bull was shot and killed during a fight over his support for the ghost dance movement. After Sitting Bull was killed, the people who were with him were arrested and taken to Wounded Knee Creek. The Native Americans were disarmed there. But Black Coyote, an old Native American who was partly deaf, waved his rifle in the air and said that he had paid too much for it. When U.S. troops saw what they thought was an act of aggression, they opened fire. Within a few minutes, they had killed more than 300 unarmed men, women, and children. People often think of the Wounded Knee Massacre as the event that marked the end of Native American resistance to U.S. expansion. About the author Dee Brown was born in Louisiana, but she grew up in a small town in rural Arkansas. As a kid, he became friends with a Native American pitcher on the baseball team where he lived. Brown learned from this that Native Americans weren't as violent or primitive as they were often made out to be. Later, Brown went to Arkansas State Teachers College to study. He worked as a librarian for the U.S. Department of Agriculture during the Great Depression. During World War II, he worked for the Department of War as a librarian. Brown wrote several works of fiction and nonfiction in his spare time in the 1950s, but none of them did very well. Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, which he wrote in 1970, was his most important work. Brown and his wife were able to move to Little Rock, Arkansas, after the success of this book. He died in 2002. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.